or to cloud. Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, this is session eight of the Nebula program. And today we're gonna learn about open code. This is the second part of the module. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna go straight to the welcome. Um, as always, this call, this call is being recorded. Um, if you prefer to keep your camera off, that's okay. Um, you can also keep it on. Um, and the call is also being transcribed. You can um, go to the captions in your um, upper right, no, left corner, and you can see the, um, the button there that says other AI um, to open live transcript. Um, we also put the link to the captions on the notepad on line 34. Um, by now, you are also familiar with the Code of Conduct and our participation guidelines. So if you experience any unacceptable behavior or have any other concerns, please contact uh, the organizers. That could be Joe, Malvika, or um, myself. Also, if you need to report an issue with one of us, um, you can email us individually. Um, and we expect you in general just to be um, nice and kind to one another. We will have activities in breakout rooms and um, please let us know if you prefer to participate by grading, by adding a, a W in front of your name. If you prefer a spoken breakout room, please add an S in front of your name. Um, and if you don't mind, still choose one for this week, just so that we know where to put you. So those are our general introduction <laughs> announcements. And um, now I'm gonna share a quick recap of where we are at the program. Okay, let me share my screen here. Um, I always struggle with this. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Okay, yeah. So as I was saying, we are in the second part of the code module. Um, and in the, on Tuesday session, we got an introduction to what is open code um, and what, is, what are some ways to use open code, um, places where we can find open code like repositories and GitHub um, and how to cite open code as well. So this session will be a little bit more practical and we're gonna dive into um, how to do uh, version control, code review, and um, the details of everything, which is the documentation for open code. Um, and next week we're gonna see open results, which is again, like a continuation of these topics but applied to results. Um, so hopefully in this session, if you have experience programming, you will um, get some practical tips on how to Im improve your best practices. Um, if you don't have experience programming, this session will also give you an idea of what developing code looks like, but there are also like best practices that you can apply to do any type of projects, whether you're working with data, whether you're working with um, developing other type of content, um, these practices are also really great to implement in those types of projects. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and um, I'm going to pass it over to Joe to introduce our expert. Thank you, Elena, for that incredibly smooth introduction. Um, it's totally wild that we're so far through this cohort already. <laughs> um, and it's also really nice seeing so many of your faces again and again and getting to, you know, recognize those names and think, oh, yeah, so and so, I know what they do. Um, anyway, less rambling. Uh, we have one of our fantastic OLS um, mentors, experts, friends, coaches, uh, Aman Goyal, who also, incidentally, works at my university at Manchester. So <laughs> go Manchester. Um, Aman, you're the expert here. Do you want to take this away? Yeah, uh, it, it still always feels very weird calling yourself an expert, but I'll take it. Uh, 
I'll paste the link to the slides for the session in case folks want to follow along. And I'll just share my screen. Okay. Perfect. Can you see the screen now? All right. I'm getting thumbs up. I'll Strong view. I hate to break it to you, but we also see prevent presenter view. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's what I figured. It doesn't have notes, it's just to control, but I'll exit this and try again. Okay, let's just go with the normal view. That looks beautiful. Yeah. So you're able to see the slides now? I'm not sure why they're fluctuating. It closed again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think... Okay, now you should be able to see them. That looks good. Perfect. Do you want to just try okay. advancing slides quickly? Yeah. Yep. Okay, it's doing Works. what we expected. All right, I'll shut up now. Go for it, my okay. friend. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to session eight for this cohort. Uh, again, like, as, as someone who is just looking at the cohort, it already feels like we're so far ahead. And congratulations that you've come this far. In this session, we'll be discussing... Some coding best practices, uh, like version control, code review, and README files. Uh, we'll try to have a look at the why of whatever we're discussing, like why we need it and what we're doing. And also, we'll also look at how. But uh, the concentration on how would be more of uh, looking at resources and looking at how you can approach the said technique, say, if you're adding a README or if you're choosing a license. And we'll focus more on what what all options you have uh, here. Uh, without further ado, I'll give a little background about myself. So I'm a research software engineer at the University of Manchester. I'm an open science enthusiast, and I'm quite interested in community building. Uh, I've worked with OLS in multiple capacities. I was once a project leader. Uh, I think that was like one and a half years, two years ago now. Uh, and then I ended up facilitating and now I'm presenting. Uh, and I'm also an SSI fellow, which is the Software Sustainability Institute. For those of uh, you who are interested in research software or working with research software, that might be an interesting avenue or institution to check out. Uh, they just do really cool work. But yeah, that's a little about me. Uh, objectives for this session, we'll look at the key considerations that we need to uh, think of while planning a new project. We'll uh, discuss readmes and look at the purpose of a readme, why we need a readme, and uh, how we uh, write one, what all we need in a readme. Then we'll also look at software licenses. I believe uh, uh, experts in the past calls have touched licenses a little bit, but we'll look at them into a little more detail and see what licenses you can choose for your project. And then we'll also look at best practices like code reviews so that we can uh, be more transparent, we can include more people and we can reproduce our code uh, in, in a good manner. So, okay, let's let's look at uh, planning of code at first and uh, then we'll move into readmes. So when starting a research project, it is useful to answer a few questions that you would think of. I would assume, uh, most folks here would have uh, answered these questions throughout the cohort or like prior to the cohort as they're figuring out. But the overall gist of it is you think of the problem and then you look at uh, what problem you're trying to solve, why you're trying to solve it. And if there are existing solutions, a lot of the times there are existing solutions uh, in case uh, you want to use them, uh, that's always great. But in a lot of cases, there might be existing solutions, but you still want to develop something of your own. So you could potentially contribute to existing solutions, but for example, it's written in a language that uh, you do not know or would not prefer for your solution, or it has a license that is not open enough to adapt it, or you're just trying to develop new techniques. Those might be good reasons to develop your own code or develop your own research project. Uh, so starting a new project, again, we look at a few overall questions. I'll quickly go over them, uh, assuming that we have part of these questions in the past. If not, again, we're always iterating over what we need in the project. So 
first we think of the scope of the project, its features and the limitations that there might be and intended audience. Then we think of the resources. So is it running on your personal computer? Is it running on the cloud? Is it running on some server and how it will be managed? Then we choose a name. So there's this XKCD comic on the right. Uh, XKCD is a very popular uh, comic book for a lot of uh, tech things in general, but I think it's it's it covers a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of science comics. But yeah, it's just like, I have definitely have had that uh, similar uh, naming of files somewhere. Uh, I still have that sometimes when I'm making quick files and it'll be a lot of untitled, lot of random files. It happens a lot in uh, Jupyter Lab, for example, if you do that. Uh, but yeah, we don't want that. We'll we'll look at organizing our files in a better way. So when naming a project, first we would want to uh, search about existing projects and make sure that we're not using trademark names. I think. In the material itself, it said to not choose embarrassing names. Uh, I'm sure like, yeah, we, we would not choose embarrassing names. I'm not sure what it even means, but okay. Uh, yeah, you would want non-controversial names, I suppose. Uh, then you would also want to avoid names which are very common. So you don't want something very generic uh, if you want, if discoverability is a priority for your project. But uh, again, uh, it depends on the priorities of the project. If it is something general, if it is something that you don't uh, mind uh, having a common name, then that's good too. But yeah, that's that's one step. Again, I would suppose that a lot of people have already finalized their project names and uh, are going ahead with that. Then version control is another important aspect of uh, managing software or technical or documentation or data projects in general. Uh, so hosting your project on a version control platform ensures that it's permanent, ensures that you're able to access it. It's accessible to the people uh, you want to give access to. And uh, also it helps you control the software using version control like Git. So if it only exists on your computer, there's always a risk of losing the software, damaging it, or if you're not using Git, even not being able to perform version control on it. Uh, another aspect is documentation. Uh, we'll look at these two bits uh, uh, at, in, in some detail later, but documenti uh, documenting your project is quite important and management of the code uh, benefits both you and people that might use your code in the future. And when you say people that might use your code in the future, a lot of the times it can be yourself. So uh, consider your future self as the biggest audience for your project because there, there can be situations wherein uh, you did something say one month ago, two months ago, or like a year ago. And when you return to it, you'll just be thinking why I did this or what does this even mean? So there are always funny stories around that uh, in, in software development, especially. So yep, it says you are your own best collaborator. So again, you uh, should take into mind that yeah, uh, you you would be interacting with the project, and to make things easier for yourself, it's always best to document it uh, properly. So documentation can save you from a lot of headache, and uh, it can also help folks who are accessing your project easily navigate your project. Uh, okay, so talking about version control, so your code would or or documentation or data. Uh, so it does not necessarily have to be code, but like whatever uh, material you're working with in your project uh, would change as you develop it. And just as we appreciate the ability to track our documents, say created by different people, like we have Google Docs or uh, even the shared notes that we're working on right now, uh, it has some ability to look at previous versions or it shows us who's entering what. Imagine version control to be a larger, more uh, detailed version of that, where it's looking at multiple files, where it's looking at who's contributing to those files, at what times, reverting to those versions, comparing those versions, or even going back in case you want to get rid of something. But version control is quite important for that. Uh, most popular tool for version control is Git. Git is the tool that we use to perform the version control. So. You might have heard Git and GitHub being coupled a lot of times. Uh, 
uh, I believe we uh, uh, majorly just use Git and GitHub for our version control flow, but Git is the tool that you use uh, that is independent from GitHub uh, that you use for version control. So it can be just on your local machine, just on your laptop or computer or wherever you want this code to be, and does not have to do anything with GitHub. Now GitHub is the uh, is the platform that you use in conjunction with Git to manage all of that and to host everything in the cloud, to uh, have everything hosted on like a web platform. So these two platforms usually work well together. Uh, work well. Uh, like they they use quite popularly, but like you also have GitLab, you also have Bitbucket. Those are other examples that you could use instead of GitHub. So Git and GitHub are the two major things that I have always used for version control. Uh, uh, so version controls helps you again, as we discussed, it helps developers to keep track changes. It helps keep track of revisions to a project. And also a lot of the times uh, it helps you get rid of undesirable changes. So you might do something which might introduce a bug to a project and Instead of, uh, so I've done this a lot, instead of solving the bug, I would just revert it and start from scratch, which again, can be questionable practice, can be a good practice, depending on what kind of bug you've introduced. But uh, yeah, you, you want to always keep track of whatever you're doing. So if you add a new file, if you add a new feature, suppose it, it crashes your software, but version control makes it easier for you to just revert that change so that you are, where you were initially before the error. Uh, but that's another importance of version control. I've added a few resources for version control if you want to look into more detail. So the first resource, which is the software carpentry course for version control, I think that's a very well-rounded resource. The material itself is really good. It covers a lot of Git and GitHub. It looks at all the basics of it. Uh, you could always self-read and you could always, you can also find workshops around that course. Then the Turing way, uh, which is a resource, data science resource has a version control chapter. We can have a look at. Uh, so again, I hope like uh, my screen is also sharing the Turing way now, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so now again, here they're talking more about version control and uh, kind of the background and how it works. Uh, and then there are other guides. So this is the carpentry course. Again, it looks in detail on how you create a GitHub account. And as someone mentioned that they created a GitHub account recently, you might want to refer to this course. Uh, and this would take you through a lot of processes that you would standard, you would uh, yeah, qu uh, follow as a standard for version control. Uh, let's go back. Yes, I can, I'm not sure where the slides went. Okay, there they are again, yeah. So now we look at documentation, uh, describing uh, our project to others. So documentation is the element of the project which is very important to describe what is uh, the content of a project and the different elements of it. So a few popular uh, aspects of documentation are the following. So a readme file, which is the first stop for a user when they approach a new project, uh, whenever someone opens a GitHub project or whenever someone reads about an overview of the project, that is the file that you're interacting with. So that would be the readme.md. Then there are contributor guidelines, which gives us information on how to contribute to the project. So for example, you've started a new project. It could be a code project, documentation project, and you want other people to contribute to it, or you just want to have guidelines for yourself and your team to contribute in a certain manner. So say, for example, you only want your title files to use underscores instead of hyphens, or you only want uh, a certain code styling standard that that uh, you're enforcing, or you, you define basically how someone contributes to the project. So it can vary from the very basics to the very uh, minute details such as what kind of environment they would need to set up, what kind of software they would need, what kind of prerequisites are there for them to contribute to the project. So like some projects 
prefer that you make a documentation change first and then a code change. So there can be different levels of contributing contributions that you can accept in the project. Then there's the code of conduct. Again, as uh, earlier in the call, we uh, discussed the code of conduct for this call. We also have code of conduct for software projects, for research projects. Uh, so we'll have a look at examples of those, uh, but code of conducts again, uh, as the name suggests, they set ground rules for participations and they help to facilitate a friendly and welcoming environment. And then there's code documentation, which is the documentation for the developers as well as the users. Uh, so code documentation is the more technical documentation. If you have a code project, uh, it might be hosted on its own. It might be a separate website uh, itself, uh, like some big projects have, or it could just be like a, a couple of readme files which describe the code. And then there is also internal code documentation when you look at code comments and uh, inline comments uh, in the code. So those are like the overall uh, types of popular documentations that we'll be looking at. Uh, again, there can be a lot of uh, more uh, kinds of documentation. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is just an overview. This is not all encompassing. So, okay, let's have a look at our first exercise and then we'll discuss a bit more about uh, documentation and readme files but what we want to do now is basically look at popular readme files from projects uh, so first we'll choose a popular software project on github again i've given some examples but these are not the exhaustive list so if you have any project that you want to look at for your domain or if there is any popular github project that you like you can you can pick that uh, what then uh, second step is inspecting the readme file. So on the home page, uh, when we open a project, so let's say open the project for this course. Uh, so yeah, this is this is the readme file. We want to look at the uh, top file, the file that is on the home page for the GitHub repository, and uh, oops. Okay, I'll keep it like this. Yeah, so we look at the readme files and then we want to note down the features of the readme file that we find interesting and would like in your own project. So again, uh, when you look at the different readme files, for example, when you look here, uh, there's an introduction, then there's a badge, then there's stating that mission, then they have information about the curriculum, methods of contributing. There is a, there are a lot of things that they've mentioned. Uh, this can vary for different projects. So if we say, look at another project, like a technical project, like Awkward Array, uh, they have a lot of technical badges, then they have some code examples, then they give us more uh, information about installation, getting help, then they discuss all the contributors for the project. So again, like, this can vary depending on the nature of the project. So we want to note down these features and we want to see uh, what features we find interesting we would like for our own project. Uh, and then we'll, uh, if, if you're done with this, uh, optionally, you can browse other documentation files. You're not expected to do so. We're concentrating on readme primarily, but in case you're already familiar with it, you can look at the contribution guidelines, code of conduct licenses. And then uh, in the end, we want to discuss amongst ourselves what you found interesting and what you would like in a, your own project. So we will do this exercise in breakout rooms. Uh, we'll do this for, instead of 15 and five, let's do 10 and five and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can increase the time if needed. Uh, how are we doing on the time for the session overall, Irene? Um, we are, it's 10.30, so I think we're good. Um, okay. Can we take a question before going to the breakout rooms? Yeah, definitely. I'm sorry, I haven't so, been looking at the chat. No, we, we're looking at that, don't worry. Um, so the question is, what's the difference between the readme and the documentation? Okay, so the readme is a subset of the documentation, more or less. Uh, so let's open a project and have a look. So when we look at this code project, uh, this is the readme file on the top, which sort of gives us an overview of the project. 
but if you want to look at the documentation then it can like be a lot more so this is like the documentation for this project which is another website of its own and it goes into a lot more detail so documentation is a more general sort of uh term for all the documentation for the project again it can be of different types as we look at it it can be the code comments it can be the readme file it can be the api guide it can be the contributor guide but readme is one of those files which is like a good one-stop file for the project so it gives a, you a good overview it might have links to other kinds of documentation but it's basically uh yeah the cover the cover file for your project for example i hope that helps uh yeah i think yeah you you said it perfectly if you read nothing else read the read me and I, I think i always found it funny when i was very new to this like since the file itself is said read me like it it's literally just asking you to start there so that's kind of like uh yeah natural but yeah you, you start with the read me yeah and another question that i think is also relevant before going to the breakout rooms for people who are not coders themselves um like these resources of open data and open code are very useful for people working more in computer science uh, but for example, Samira is saying um, that she's a linguist. And so how mm -hmm. could, could these resources be useful for other fields? Hmm. Uh, okay. My expertise would probably limit my answer, but from what I can imagine, like one, uh, it depends on uh, the structure of your project. So for example, your project is not a software project. It's just, uh, it is documentation or it is, uh, say a collection of Google Docs, you can still have a README file. So a README file is again, looking at an overview of the project and it can be in any form. Here we're discussing GitHub, here we're looking at more more into technical projects, but yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking uh, how you could use README files. But again, say even if you're a linguist or if you would, if you're like in any, any other fields which is not software development uh if you're hosting your project on github or if you're hosting your project say in multiple files and you just want say one file which have which has information uh one other example i can think of is say when you download certain software or certain uh data they might accompany a readme file so again there might be say 10 Excel files, and you don't know what those Excel files have, but there's a text file, which is the readme file, you can open it and that file, for example, mentions, yeah, okay, these Excel files contain this data in this format and so on and so forth. So again, like a readme is more about the overview rather than the technical bits. It can be adapted to any, uh, yeah, any uh, subject or any uh, field for that matter, from what I can imagine. Uh, but yeah, uh, isn't the head of computer science department at Manchester? Yeah, I think Andrew is a linguist, although I'm not sure. But yeah, that's that's probably uh, a good fact. Uh, but yeah, does that help with the question? I think I think so. I hope so. Uh, Joe, do we have the breakup rooms? Ready? Yeah, yeah. Um, shall I open them up? Is everyone super clear on what we're doing? Uh, yeah. So to summarize again, we're looking at a software project of your choice. I've given some examples. If you want to look at them, you look at the README, you think of what features you want for yourself, and then you discuss amongst yourselves. Give yourself 10 to 12 minutes to look at the project itself to make notes. And then in the end, uh, the five minutes to discuss amongst yourself and maybe you can make notes in the shared notes uh, group wise if you want. Thanks, Aman. I'm opening those rooms now. Uh, anyone get a did anyone get a chance to note anything down or let's just uh 
go with volunteers from each room, probably. What do you think, you? Uh, Sounds good. We have three rooms. Shall we ask for the written breakout room first? Is anyone able to speak up? Or do you, if someone prefers to type, that's fine too. Uh, Priya, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, for one of us, it was completely new. So they were listening what we, uh, the other two uh, participants were um, giving uh, back after having a search quick search so myself and andrew were talking about uh, um, um uh, andrew was mentioning that it is uh, new from what they are used to from their software uh, platform so it is going to be useful for him and for me i was uh, uh, looking for um, making a repository or creating a repository for some material research uh, related uh, contributions. So I thought um, I found um, calling for contributions is the interesting one for me because uh, when we make a repository, we need contribution from different people for sure. And finding community who have like-minded thoughts, like who will be willing to uh, contribute their time and energy uh, to see something, uh, the vision coming into reality is the uh, will be a bigger challenge. So calling for contributions uh, with a link that they can go into and have an idea about what the vision is and uh, what kind of information they can contribute. That is what um, was most interesting for me. That's great to know. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone from the written room? I think I skipped over that, sorry. Uh, Feel free to type it in the chat or speak up if you'd like to. Um, hi, I am from the group one. <laughs> and um, uh, jo Joanna was explaining us uh, how to how to apply the, the README and on the GitHub platform because some of us didn't uh, had didn't know how how to do this and uh, um let me remember the name and uh, samira was telling us that she usually use a kind of readme on the the project but uh, in github is a little bit different so joanna was explaining us uh, how to how to use it uh, which also reminds me, thank you for sharing that, Anna. Uh, Joanna had a question about uh, documentation in general. Joanna, would you like to uh, present that question to the room and we can discuss that? I think that's a good question. Okay, so I was saying that all along, I assumed the documentation of a code happens in the README. So when you gave us the disparity of what a README should be, what the documentation is it's like still confusing so then i checked the tops um github and i realized that they only had the readme and not the documentation so i wanted to know if the strict divide between what a readme should be what a documentation should be is only for software engineering projects or mm -hmm. uh, maybe i need to reorient myself of what like the two terms are mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, okay. So looking back at, again, the readme versus documentation sort of terminology. Uh, one, so it can be both. So uh, my answer might be a little confusing, but say if you have a project which is quite self-contained or quite small on the on a scale uh, of the software projects, your readme can be your entire documentation. So that is entirely possible for small projects wherein you would not benefit from having separate documentation. But uh, as goes with sort of most projects, it depends on what kind of project. So it's not necessary that only a software project can have separate documentation. Sometimes uh, data projects have separate documentation where they might have a readme giving an overview, but then they have another documentation file describing the data types in detail. So again, there is no hard and fast uh, distinction between uh, this is a readme or this is in the documentation, but the general practice is you start with a readme, you 
give an overview. And then as your project evolves, say it increases in size, if it's a code project or if it's a data project or like depending on what the scale of the project is, you decide your documentation. So some people again, prefer to just have that on GitHub. Some people prefer to have a separate documentation if it's like a lot of things that they want to refer to. But again, there's no there's no rule written in stone as such around that. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and yeah, uh, nice. yeah thank you. Uh, okay, do we want a quick reflection from the last room? Uh, that was Ahmed and Mohammed, I think. That was Mohammed and Ahmed. Uh, again, feel free to just type it in the chat. Uh, if you want to, or feel free to speak up. Oh, yes. Uh, so we have basically to... We can tell you're talking, but you're super, super quiet for me. Uh, how about now? No. Are you sure you're not hiding in a box far away from your microphone? No. no. <laughs> no. no. Maybe I think the problem is that... Uh, I I can tell that you're saying something about the problem. Uh, unfortunately, I we're still not hearing. Uh, I don't know if you're like trying to change the input device or. Okay, how about now? Still the same, my friend. Uh, maybe. Um, Maybe it makes sense to either ask Muhammad to report back or ask if one of you could write it for now. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Also, in, in interest of time, uh, let's probably do a written uh, reflection. Sorry, I heard my name. Just someone knocked on the door. Oh, did I miss something? <laughs> uh, no, we were just talking about uh, reflections from the breakout room. But I oh, think yeah, okay. we can, uh, if you want, you can just type it in the chat and uh, we can take it forward with the presentation. OK. Uh, all right, I'll share my slides again. Okay, uh, hopefully that exercise was useful for everyone. Uh, we'll I'll, I'll quickly discuss more about the documentation that we looked at. So when we look at README, uh, these are again, general rules that it should contain the name of the project. It could have a list of dependencies if it's a code project then again depending on the nature of the project it could have installation instructions and instructions about uh, what the software contains detailed description if there is no external documentation examples and acknowledgements so i think the acknowledgement bit might have been a common theme if you were exploring different projects so if you look at the nasa repository or the turing way or awkward arrays they all had this section at the bottom which basically uh, gave details about who has contributed to the project in what manner. Uh, but yeah, these are again, general guidelines. You do not have to be hard and fast about it, but these are like, yeah, uh, this is where you can start uh, and develop a readme more. Uh, one uh, one uh, question just yeah. on that previous slide. If I'm not a coder, what does a list of dependencies mean? Uh, yeah, okay, good question. So, uh, if, if you do not have a code project, dependencies are basically the software you would need to run your project itself. So for example, uh, for, okay, I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but for example, yeah, if, for, for sharing my screen, I'm using Zoom here. Uh, so you could think of in, in that sense that Zoom is the dependency that is required to share my screen here. But in a more literal sense, it would be the software that would you would need to run the software you're installing. So NumPy, for example, uh, is a popular dependency for a lot of scientific computing projects. But yeah. Uh, uh, another thing that uh, I think the third breakout room mentioned was badges. And I quickly wanted to show folks what badges are. So badges are these little buttons that we see on the top of a GitHub repository. Uh, they are, they've been very popular recently uh, on readme files. So badges basically give you a quick overview. So for example, 
and it's giving us the project information or say a link to their Twitter and Mastodon or telling us build information. So like the CI is currently failing or say the other tests are passing, even say a citation or a DOI. So if you look at the readme uh, syntax, you'll be able to find the bad syntax. And again, if you look up uh, software badges, you'll find a lot of them. Again, this does not limit to code documentation. You can just have badges uh, pointing out to different resources, pointing out to research papers or the DOI for the project, but that's something that you might find interesting. Uh, looking at other types of documentation that are contributing guidelines. So these are, again, uh, the guidelines, as we said, discussed before, just how you tell people to contribute. Then there's code of conduct. You can have that in GitHub now. So if you have a code of conduct file, it shows up as a code of uh, conduct tab in GitHub. Uh, and then there's code level documentation. So this is an example of technical documentation. So if you have a code project and uh, you have a code file, you can have documentation internally in the code. So for example, this is a NumPy uh, function I picked up. And here, when you see these three quotation marks, this is basically uh, the documentation for that code within the function. So this is all happening within the code. Uh, in Python, this is called a doc string. You do not need to worry about the syntax, but it varies from language to language. But this is an example of uh, describing what this function is doing within the code itself. And we can use this information itself to generate our technical documentation. So uh, for example, it tells what this function is doing. It's returning true for each element if it's a string, of uh, if, if the string is a digit. Uh, and uh, you can have this again for all the elements of your code. You can have comments, you can have doc strings, you can have different types of uh, code documentation within the code. Uh, then there's the code documentation for users, which is the front end of the documentation that we're looking at, which is what we're seeing on the website or on GitHub. So if you write your documentation within the code itself there, are pieces of software that can extract that information. So uh, AstroPy and NumPy, if you look at their documentation, uh, they are good examples of auto-generated documentation. So for example, we look at, let's let's go to their API. Do we have their API? Oh, user guide, for example. But yeah, so for example, some of this documentation uh, can be auto-generated using what you have inside uh, the code. So say some of these, this documentation, you can just look at directly at the doc string that you defined within the code. And there are pieces of software which can do that job for you. Uh, so yeah, Swings and for Python is a popular automatic documentation generation tool, then Doxygen is another one. Markdown is the language that usually uh, is very popular for documentation. So uh, that's another level of code documentation that you can look at. Uh, okay, licenses. Yeah, so that's that's more or less about code documentation and readme's. Let's also now look at licenses. Again, I believe uh, other uh, calls have discussed, have touched upon licenses. Uh, in some manner, so we can have have an overview and then look at actual licenses. So licenses are basically the basis of how scientists use, make, and share code and software. So uh, licenses take various forms and they outline the contractual obligations that you might have, what the user may do with the software, how the user can share the software, how uh, the user may distribute it further, and the length of the time the user uh, has the right to use software. So a license basically is a permission file, so to say, for your project, which outlines if someone else is using it or if someone else is uh, developing it further, uh, what rights do they have or how they may they might do it. So openness is a spectrum. This is from the TOPS curriculum, wherein you can have licenses which are very open to very closed. Again, it depends on what kind of 
what kind of uh, license you want to have for the project, what kind of permissions you want to give to the user. So some common type of software licenses, there are the public domain licenses, which is uh, free to use for anyone. Uh, then there are the lesser general domain, which can link to open source libraries and code can be licensed under any license type. There is the permissive license type, which gives users wide, but not the complete latitude to reuse license. Oops. Uh, there's the non-permissive, which is, uh, which allows users to reuse, but give uh, them the responsibility to share the changes with the community. This copy left, which is, uh, which can be used uh, for distribution modification if all the code involved is under the same license. So for example, there is license X, which is copy left. If I define that, and if someone else adapts my project, they also have to use a license, which is either the same license X or a license which is compatible with X. So it basically limits someone that they have to share the work further under the same license. And then there's proprietary code, which cannot be copied, modified, or distributed. So a lot of the software that we used, a lot of the uh, corporate or closed source software that we used uh, comes under proprietary licenses. So for example, uh, if you're using a Windows or an Apple machine, a lot of the software that you would use on that uh, would come under proprietary software, which uh, cannot be, uh, again, you cannot access the source code, you cannot copy or modify it, you can just use it as user. These are again the common type of licenses. I, I sort of ran through uh, it quickly because uh, we'll be looking at in detail what open source licenses are. Uh, so there are two main types of open source licenses. Uh, the first one is permissive license. Uh, the open source initiative defines a permissive license as a license that guarantees the freedom to use, modify, redistribute, and create derivative works. So again, you uh, it, it is, as the name suggests, it is quite permissive by nature. An example of this is the Apache 2.0 license by the Apache Software Foundation. It is one of the most popular and widely used permissive licenses. MIT license is another popular one that you might have heard of or observed in software projects. Uh, the other type is the protective license or the copyleft license, which grants certain freedoms of copies of the copyright works within the requirements that the same rights, <coughs> excuse me, need to be preserved in the derivative work. So as we uh, mentioned before, copyleft licenses uh, want the work which is further produced. They want to, uh, they want you to use the same permissions for the work that you're producing using that license. So, it allows the user to re reuse, but also requires them to share the changes using the same license. So it's sort of propagating that, okay, I wrote this under this license, but I, if you're reusing this, you're welcome to, but if you want to carry it further, uh, you have to use the same license. That That's kind of the philosophy that they use. Uh, an example is the GPL, which is the general public license uh, that is a popular predictive license. Uh, so this is uh, a quick look at different licenses. So we have software licenses and content licenses. Uh, so say when we look at non-copyleft license or permissive licenses, there is the BSD and the MIT license or the APL license. Uh, then they have certain clauses. Again, you do not need to worry about the technicalities of this right now. Uh, a lot of websites, so for example, the Choose a License website, it tries to simplify or tell you what permissions you have. Uh, GitHub also gives you a good summary of the kind of licenses you can choose or the type of permissions that it has. Uh, if you want to look in the technicalities, definitely, if it's important for you to uh, have control over all the specifics of a license, it's useful to look at that. But a good starting point might be to look at the philosophy of a license rather than getting yourself confused with all the technicalities because the legal terms can sometimes be confusing. I, I am forgetting the name. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get it in the chat, but there was this website which sort of tries to uh, talk about licenses in more layperson language. They try to get rid of the legal jargon and simplify the licenses for you. 
uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but yeah. Uh, so these are examples for software licenses. Uh, you have the copyleft license like GPL and MPL. And then there are content licenses. So the Creative Commons licenses are the popular one for pure content projects. So uh, there's the CC0, CC BY, and then there's also the data license, uh, which is also Creative Commons, which is CC0. These are examples of different types of licenses depending on your project, depending on the kind of permissions that you want to give within the project. Uh, the, then there's a quick look of how we, we can add a license via GitHub. Uh, we'll just have a quick look, but if you want to have, uh, if you want to add license via GitHub, you can most definitely look it up and GitHub has detailed documentation on how you do that. But for example, when you're creating a new repository, you get this dialog box where you can choose a license and it gives you a drop down menu to basically choose whatever license you want. Another way, if you have already created the, the directory, the project, and do not have a license, you can go to GitHub and you can create a license file. And as soon as you give it the keyword license, it gives you this option to choose a license template uh, on the right. And then you can click on that and then select your license. So these are the two ways you can use GitHub to add a license. You can add it manually. It will recognize the license. Uh, and uh, you can have a look at the different permissions of the repository. Uh, that's more or less about the licenses. We'll get to an exercise about this in a minute. Uh, I quickly also wanted to point out code reviews, which is an important aspect of code development. So for folks working with software projects especially, I'm not sure if there is an equivalent of code reviews in non-software projects, but say if it's documentation or if it's information, there's uh, just reviewing of all the information. So it does not have to be code in that sense. Uh, but for example, uh, yeah, we have peer review in academia. That is that is uh, the closest analogy, but code review uh, basically benefits from the peer review in the same way as we do in science or in any other field, wherein, uh, someone who has who is not the author of the work looks at the work and then critiques it then looks uh, at the correctness or uh, looks at what can be improved in that piece of work so that can be code that can be a piece of research a piece of documentation uh, and having someone else read over your code is a way to uh, is the best way to improve the quality of the code because again uh, having a third eye always sort of gives you a different perspective or uh, might give you a look at things that you might have overlooked. Uh, many version control platforms have built-in tools that enable developers to uh, give code reviews. So GitHub has a very popular uh, code review mechanism. So there's an AstroPy PR, which is a pull request, uh, which is an example of a code review that they've given. But let's have a quick look over this. So. Again, if you're not familiar with uh, PRs, uh, these are basically ways to make contributions to a project, but this is someone making a new contribution to this project. And uh, then on GitHub, people can basically comment. So someone from the project commented uh, about the project, then someone reviewed it. So if you look at this, they basically looked at a particular line and then they commented on that line and gave them instructions in detail on how they could change it or what could be made better. And then they basically go on further to have a discussion about the changes that they made uh, uh, in the project. But this is one example. Uh, this sort of goes on and on where they're looking at different lines of code that were changed, different lines of documentation that were changed. And then they discuss the problems, the potential solutions and guide the person who they're reviewing for. Uh, you can you can do this via GitHub. So when you look into more about, uh, more into collaboration over GitHub, you'll be able to see uh, these kind of, uh, yeah, dialog boxes where you can look at something and you can review the changes, you can approve it, you can decline it, you can request for the changes, but that's a way to code review. Again, this is a mechanism that GitHub provides you to do the code review. You do not have to stick to it. You do not have to uh, exactly go by GitHub's uh, format for code reviews. You can do it manually. You can do it uh, using other tools as well. 
Uh, so that's code review. And uh, then let's get to our second exercise. I think we're a little uh, overrunning on I the time. We so can we do can nine minutes in the yeah. right out room. <laughs> we'll, we'll shorten it. Let's do nine and three, uh, probably. But uh, what, we, what we'll try to do is we'll first look at a software licensing website. So depending on the nature of your project, if it's a software project, you can choose an open source license. If it's a, a, a documentation project, you can you look at Creative Commons licenses. Uh, oops, sorry. I know where my slides disappear from time to time. And reload it. Okay, there they are again. Uh, yeah, so we'll look at open source licenses. So this is the open source license website uh, where you can look at different licenses where they give you options. I want it simple and permissive. I need to work in a community, depending on our priorities. Then there's the Creative Commons licenses, which basically look at all the CC licenses, uh, depending on the nature of a project. What we want to do is we want to read and inspect what might be suitable license for a project. You do not need to finalize a project, uh, license within the short time that we have, but you can sort of have an idea of what kind of license you would want or have optionally a list of licenses that you feel might align with the project. And then we'll do a quick debrief and uh, see what licenses you would like for your projects. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, do we have the breakout rooms? Yeah. Hey, um, yeah, they're ready. I'm going to put you back in the same breakout rooms as before. Just a reminder, licenses are relevant no matter what domain you come from. Even So this is the code section um, this week. That's why we're talking about code a lot. Um, it's good to have an idea about code, even if you don't use it on a day-to-day -day basis. But this activity, choosing a license, is relevant to everyone. Try and think about what licenses you'd share your work under. Um, and if you don't use code, go for those content licenses. That's the second option down there. Opening the rooms now. Call you back in nine minutes because we are otherwise going to overrun. Everyone. Oh, thank you, Irene. <laughs> Right, we are at the end of our time. Um, we hope that you found this session useful. Um, the one quick reminder I will add is you don't have to be a coder to, to at least have the basics of the concepts. Um, you may or may not apply them in your work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I do know that we've had a couple of people in the Slack and the general Slack who are talking about um, how they use GitHub, with, even if they aren't using it on a code um for code um but the point of this week was to expose you to some of those basic concepts um we will probably reach out a little bit because i think we'd like to learn a little bit more just about how you felt the technical pitch of this lesson was and we'd love to hear about that and whether there's anything we should adjust um other than that i think we're going to wrap up um and Thank you so much. Can I just have a round of applause for Aman for preparing this lesson for everyone? All right, if you want to hang around um, and ask any questions, you may. I'm turning the recording off. And if not, have a lovely rest of your week.